he is my mentor at this university and I've benefited from his advice and his support. But he's also an expert on the history of freedom of speech and the First Amendment in the United States. And so without much ado, I invite Professor Chidmik. Thank you, Mokhtada. Um, my field is, is constitutional law of the United States, and so I'm going to talk just a little bit about the First Amendment, freedom of speech provision, which is written in language that sounds like there's absolutely no way to punish speech. If you read the Constitution of the United States, the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof of religion or, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. It sounds very sweeping, it sounds very all-embracing, and it is by judicial interpretation. There were times in American history where people went to prison merely for criticizing the government. This goes all the way back to the beginning of this republic. In the election of 1800, 24 people were, were jailed who criticized the Adams administration, the president of the United States. But today, we have almost absolute free speech, almost. The only time that free speech probably would not be protected is if you could make a case that the harm done is so substantial, so overwhelming, that it outweighs freedom of speech. Now, if you're an absolutist, if you literally read the First Amendment, you might say, first of all, um, it says no law. No law abridging the freedom of speech. But if you're really a literalist, you would have to ask, what is the freedom of speech that can't be abridged? It's not anything. I have no right to, for example, can I commit perjury? I mean, is that free speech? Can I disclose the secrets of the government of the United States as it's about to engage in a war? Is that free speech or is that treason? So there's, there's always this tension. But Ordinarily, today, in the United States, as interpreted by the United States Supreme Court, which is our highest federal court, you have a position in which the court is almost willing to protect anything. Almost. The key point here is when speech becomes conduct, then it is not speech. But I'm talking to you right now, and I'm also making noise, maybe keeping some of you awake. Sorry about this. I probably get one phone call a year. <laughs> and, uh, sorry. Um, I'm also talking, making noise, bothering maybe some of you with the sound of my voice. Who knows? But I'm also trying to say something. There's a cognitive message here. So the difference between speech and conduct is basically the line that the Supreme Court of the United States in hundreds of cases has drawn. Let me just say this. The crucial component of the First Amendment that protects, that, that should be protected, and the court has said it is, is political speech. What is political speech? Is what happened in Paris Political speech, people who criticized, people who supported what took place, the 54 Frenchmen who were arrested for criticizing. I don't know much about French or German or Italian constitutional law, but I do know about American constitutional law that you can criticize those cartoons would be protected in this country without any legal battle at all. They, they may not be they may perhaps shouldn't be protected, but the Supreme Court has interpreted a cartoon to be an unreal statement. It's not real. It's just a, it's, it's a satire. It's a parody. It's, it's not a real factual statement. If it were a factual statement and it ruined your reputation, then you could be you might be 
able to sue the person who makes such a statement against you. For example, if I pointed out in my classes a certain student and said he was the stupidest student I've ever had, when it, in fact it's not true, and as a result the student loses a scholarship or something like that, he could clearly sue me for that. That's not political speech. The basic core of the First Amendment is political dialogue so that we can have a free exchange of ideas as we're having right now. This is protected form of speech. What is not protected, there are some speech that is not protected. Pornography, for example, is not protected speech, although you find that hard to believe in this country. You can find it anywhere, uh, even in Newark. Uh, you have areas such as false commercials, commercials that mislead people, that's not protected. Deliberate libel or slander, that's not protected. Some of it is, but it's very complicated. But what is not protected is what you would call, some people think hate speech is not protected. Hate speech is the, the big topic of the day. But hate speech is protected in this country, unless it is conduct. When does it become conduct? For example, a student could say that I think Islam is the worst religion in the world, that it's a dangerous religion, that it's a disastrous religion, that it's a violent religion. A student has the right to say that just as much as I have a right to quote the Constitution of the United States because that's speech. The solution to that speech is counter speech. Is sunlight is the best disinfectant. The solution for bad speech is good speech, better speech, responses. But if on the other hand the student went to a young woman who was wearing the hijab and what was known to be a Muslim and went to her face and said something really horrendous, never touched her, but said something very, very insulting, then you are in closer to the concept of conduct, which would not be protected by the First Amendment. Then it becomes an assault. It's no longer speech. So the big problem is defining what is speech, what is conduct. Under the United States Constitution, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, you have a right to lie. Just three years ago, the Supreme Court said, this man was prosecuted in federal court for deliberately lying about himself. He said he was in the Marines for 25 years, he had the Congressional Medal of Honor, he had a bunch of other honors, from, and he wasn't ever in the military at all. Congress had passed a law that said, this is stealing the, the valor of those who have, in fact, suffered in the military. And so it should be illegal to engage in this kind of deliberate lie. The Supreme Court said the statute was unconstitutional. It could not be enforced against you. Like I could stand up here and say that I published every one of Professor Khan's publications. He never published anything. He came to see me on his mentor. I published it for him. It would be completely false, but I have a right to say it. It sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Also, cartoons are absolutely protected because they're not real. They do not speak about anything real. They can hurt. They can offend. You may have heard, uh, those of you who are uh, old enough may have heard of a case that was in the 1980s involving the Reverend Jerry Falwell, who was a Baptist minister, the leader of the moral majority, who was a very engaged political activist, but a minister of, of the gospel as well. There was published in a magazine a photograph, a cartoon, of him in an outhouse, you know what an outhouse is, uh, we don't have them anymore, at least in, around here. He was in the outhouse having sex with his mother, and they were both drunk. He sued and won $185,000 in the lower courts, but the Supreme Court of the United States, without a single dissent, 
said it. Cartoons are absolutely protected. No one took it seriously. No one believed it. No one thought it was true. If cartoons were ever subject to exclusion from the First Amendment, you wouldn't have shows like Jon Stewart, not that I'm endorsing Jon Stewart. You wouldn't have any kind of comedy. People would be having all kinds of problems expressing themselves. They would be afraid to draw cartoon, cartoons that might offend somebody. So the Supreme Court has said, unless it's a statement of fact, it is not speech. So it's very complicated. It's very, very different. I know in France, in Germany, and in Italy, there are hate, hate speech laws. No person can lawfully deny the existence of the Holocaust in France or Germany and Italy. In Italy, you cannot criticize a priest. There's a, there is a law in the Italian governments uh, called the Villapendio, which says that any criticism of any priest or bishop is an offense against the Republic of Italy. That's, none of that is true in this country. And that's really the only thing I know about is what is free speech in this country. So, thank you. Thank you, Professor Deggy, for your wonderful seminar on free speech. Uh, some of the things that was new even to some of us who think we know about freedom of speech, so thank you very much. And it's important for Muslims to hear about this because uh, the First Amendment is, is the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. It is the Establishment Clause, one of the most important things. When I read the words in the Quran like Raha fi deen, there is no compulsion in religion. When I read it, I thought, oh my God, this is the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment in the Quran. It says the same thing that the First Amendment in the U.S. Constitution says. Uh, our next speaker is Sheikh Hadid, who, who is the host of a, a national and internationally syndicated television show that comes out of Philadelphia. We are very fortunate that he is a resident of the Delaware community and does wonderful halakhas or circles of knowledge at the Tarbiya Mosque uh, in the morning. And uh, even though I don't attend the mosque in the morning, I do attend his halakhas on YouTube. Uh, so without much ado, Shaykh Hadid. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum. 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 Good evening to our guests. Um, I just want to make a couple of brief points. I just need you guys to stay with me for a little bit. All right? Number one is that freedom of speech is a virtue that many countries and many people don't have the luxury to exercise. Okay? Uh, I went to school in Saudi Arabia. I lived there for almost eight years of my life. So I've had some exposure to other countries and how they function, how they operate. And I can tell you that as Americans, we have some luxuries, freedom of speech being one of them, that people in other countries don't have, right? And I think that we take those freedoms and those luxuries for granted when we use freedom of speech to insult people's religion, insult people's faiths, people literally, they become attached to their faith to the point where they believe that the only salvation that they have in life is based upon the faith that they believe in. And to have someone come and insult that under the guise of freedom of speech, in my estimation, would be taking this luxury that we have and just abuse it because as people who can exercise freedom of speech there's so many things that we can speak out against <coughs> oppression you know marginalization of certain ethnicities and cultures and you know there's so many things that we can utilize freedom of speech for and no way am i justifying what happened to um, the journalists at charlie Hebert. But the thing is, is that um, I'm pretty much a straight shooter, and I you know, don't really cut corners, and I think that there are people out there who like to hear it straight up without all of the political jargon, without all of the political correctness that everybody is kind of tiptoeing around, right? This is freedom of speech, right? I'm free to say, right? I'm exercising that right now, right? 
Okay, but uh, in quoting Pope Francis today, right, and you guys had to know that this was coming. Right? <laughs> and I mean, like, we, we respect the Pope and, you know, what he said was, was definitely on point. But I think the voices of the people who, you know, adhere to their respective religions, their voices should be enough. We shouldn't have to have Pope Francis, who's a Catholic, who comes and says that there should be limits to freedom of speech when it comes to insulting people's religion. Why did Pope Francis have to say that? Why, when a Muslim says that, why wasn't that enough? Why does Pope Francis have to say that before people, the light bulb goes off in people's heads and they say, oh wow, you know, that does make sense. Why do the people who, the voices of the people who adhere and believe in their respective faiths why isn't that enough? And yes, a pe people do have the right to, to insult you. They can insult you. But as Pope Francis said, as he had one of his friends traveling with him, he said that if my friend said something about my mother, right, then he has to expect that I'm going to punch him in the face. Right? And he threw a punch at the guy. And it was in a joking manner. He was being facetious. But there is a reality to that. And that is that when you insult people, you have to understand that there will be some backlash to that. And the, the thing that bothers me the most is that we, here in America, Islam has been here since the very beginning, even before, as some accounts may, you know, may boast. But the point that I'm making is that we live amongst Muslims. There are all of these Muslims. I, I mean, you go, I flew to um, Minnesota, right, which is probably where the largest population of Somalis are in America, and the whole airport is literally run by Somalis. So if Muslims are terrorists, Muslims are this or that, then how is it that a whole airport in America is being ran by Muslims? And we buy into that, because it's easy to paint people with one brush to say, oh, they're all like that, and your next door neighbor is Muslim. Your colleague that you work with is Muslim, but we'll still say they're all like that. And, it's, and it's, it's not fair. It's not fair. And I mean, in, you know, in Islam, we are literally obligated to protect houses of worship. There's a verse in the Quran that says that if Allah had not checked one people by way of another, then many mosques, synagogues, and churches, and places where God's name is revered would have been destroyed. This is a verse in the Quran. Well, we are obligated to protect houses of worship, even if people don't share the same faith that we have. And, you know, unfortunately, the religion of Islam is under constant scrutiny due to the actions of a loud minority. And make no mistake about it, these people are a minority. Out of the 1.8 billion Muslims, and they grow every day because someone is embracing Islam every single day, right? Out of the 1.8 billion Muslims around the world, these people ex with these extreme ideologies and concepts, they are a loud minority. Because the vast majority of Muslims do not believe in that, do not condone that, do not advocate for that. And the last thing that I wanted to draw home, draw, draw, the point that I wanted to bring home is that Islam is not made up of one set of beliefs and behaviors that are practiced and adhered to by one group of people all the time. All right, and if we were to take that sentence and kind of chop it up and dissect it, we would understand that every other religion has the same dilemma. Islam is not one religion, although we would like to believe that it is one religion with one, be one set of beliefs, one set of behaviors, one set of people, group of people who all adhere to those things uh, emphatically. Unfortunately, in a perfect world, yes, we don't live in a perfect world, right? So, number one, there are Muslims that come from different understandings of Islam. You have different sects of Islam, Shiitism, Sufism, you know, Sunnis, you, you name it, you name it. And Prophet Muhammad prophesied that, you know, the religion would split into these, you know, different sects, just as Christianity and Judaism split into different sects. All right. So for those of you who are not Muslim, you have other faiths, you understand exactly